Hi, and welcome to the very first episode of the Deconstruction Podcast. My name is Emily, and I'm a recently admitted lawyer at Helix Legal, and this is... My name is Michael Chesterman. I'm a director of Helix Compliance. Um, We're both very excited to be doing this podcast series. So what's next then? Well, before we um, get into this episode that we've recorded, we just want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're recording today, the Turrbal and Jagera people. And we'd also like to pay our respects to the elders past and present. So before we jump into the first episode, um, we want to expand a little bit on why we started the podcast series in the first bit, because we touched on it briefly um, when we welcomed Kate, but I got a little bit flustered. Pause for laughter. (laughs) So me going totally off script. Um, what we're going to try to do in this in this uh, podcast episode in these podcast episodes is to break down um, overused platitudes and cliches, which I think make people lazy when it comes to talking about issues in the construction industry. So we want to talk to people who want to, who want to outline real solutions uh, and not just uh, parrot platitudes and cliches like. Um, you know, we've got to do something better about addressing homelessness or we've got to do more social housing. How? So that's that's the essence of what we're going to be doing. Hmm. And, yeah, throughout our series, we're going to chat to a variety of interesting people and we've got a really great lineup of 12 that we've started our recording with so far and we're, ep- we're excited to roll those out soon. Um, yeah, lots of people with fresh perspectives and some who might not necessarily get a lot of um, opportunity to talk about them on a platform or event. It's, so It's very true. We want to talk to people who, not just the usual CEOs or the, mm. or the, the big hitters, so to speak, but people who have got policy uh, running through their veins, who've got a, an interest in policy and legislation, and also people who are just... Yeah, significant people in the industry who have never been asked to that on their views and things like this. So um, mm. we really are excited about this series, and we hope you like our first episode uh, where we interview Kate Raymond of the Master Builders, and she has some really, really good points to make. And um, we had a good time chatting to her. And I can't say it any better. So that's a that's a wrap. Enjoy. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome, Kate, to our first podcast episode. I suppose I, we better start with an introduction to the podcast first. Um, Michael Chesterman and my name's Emily Taylor and we are Helix Legal and um, our podcast is called Deconstruction and we want to deconstruct the platitudes and the cliches in the construction industry. So we are starting with our first guest and I think you were the first guest on Michael's last <laughs> series. So um, seems fitting to kick it off with you. So Kate Raymond and you are um, um, a general manager, advocacy and policy at Master Builders Queensland. So, um, did you want to uh, explain about your role and how you got there and, and a bit about your experience? Sure. Um, I'm very grateful to be working um, in the building industry in Queensland and I have spent the majority of my career in that space. Um, so, I started out as a construction lawyer um, in one of the national firms, um, loved just landed in it by accident and loved construction from the get-go. Um, moved into government and did a lot of contract drafting, <clears throat> um, procurement, some dispute resolution, insolvency work, and um, and that was great as well. I really enjoyed it. Um, found myself in some other positions, policy, regulatory. Um, I have worked at the QBCC. Um, I've also worked in a national policy role, which I really enjoyed as well, and the opportunity came up to work for Master Builders Queensland in this position and I just couldn't say no, it was brilliant. 
Mm. So master, I should say a little bit about master builders, I yes, guess. So, yes. um, so we represent, it's not just builders, we represent builders, trade contractors and associated um, professions and members in Queensland. We have almost 10,000 members across the state. We represent our members all around the state. We have regional offices from the Gold Coast to Cairns and in between. Mm. Um, we provide a lot of um, services and products, um, but also advocacy and professional advice to our members. Um, and we're quite a unique organisation in the broad range of services and products that we do actually provide to our members. Mm. Yeah. What kind of what kind of role would you say that you do day to day in your job? I would. The good thing about my job is that every day is different and quite often things will just land and no, never predicted that that would happen and all of a sudden that's what the day is all about. <laughs> so it's a mix of, I'll say it's a mix of reactive and proactive work yeah. in advocacy and policy. So when things are proposed from government, we will absolutely respond and seek our members' views. We have policy committees mm -hmm. um, and our members volunteer on those and we have members from throughout the state on those committees. Um, a broad range of members who will um, guide our policy direction for us to, um, and then obviously we have a board that will determine that. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll respond to proposals and put forward the view of the membership to say we support, we don't support for these reasons. Mm -hmm. We get involved in a lot of committees and discussions and there's mm -hmm. all that, that sort of government type stuff that happens. Um, but then there's also proactive, positive work not that reactive is always negative but there's other things that we do that that we sort of choose to do where we look to you know what can we do to benefit essentially improve the lives of our members in relation to their role in the building industry that's that's as far as I see that my role is mm, yeah do you enjoy being kind of part of the flip side of it at master builders being in, in the advocacy role compared to your previous jobs like do you like um, talking to people and finding out what they've got to say and and like kind of the reverse of what you would you spent many years doing yeah you, you really different. you really hit it though um, yeah. talking to people and finding out what they have to say is mm. is critical and I, I love it I love getting out um, and talking to our members and hearing from them firsthand. What are they experiencing? What are what are the difficulty? What are the pain points? What are the areas where we might be able to do something to actually improve the way that the building industry operates? Mm. Um, and I just love getting out and talking to our members. Mm. I saw a picture the other day for the first time for a long time. All your regional people were down together. How, how did that go? It was brilliant. So the regional managers um, all report in to me and I love working with them. They're a brilliant bunch. Um, and we, we actually had some all staff, two days where it was all staff of master builders getting together for the first time. And the regional managers all came in, all came down the day before, and we spent some time together as a group and went out and um, went out on a site, which is brilliant, mm. one of our members' sites. Um, and it was it was really great to actually have that um, time in person. Really grateful to master builders for agreeing to to you know have those days where we could all actually get together in person. Mm. It's nice when you can go do that and kind of see where what your work is doing in the real practical sense rather than just if you're in the computer sometimes it can be hard to grasp what you're yep. actually doing nice to see it in action so true yeah. and i love to get out on site <clears throat> get out on site when i can yeah. um, which isn't every day obviously yeah. um, but when i can i love to <clears throat> excuse me i love to see what is what does it actually look like like i've seen yeah. i've seen this on a plan or i've seen it in an email where it's been dot points to me about what it looks like mm. but to actually get out there and go oh, that's what that actually looks like. Mm. Um, it's brilliant, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, sounds like you're really enjoying it. Um, so, yeah, our podcast, Platitudes and Clichés, and when we had our catch up with you, our pre-podcast chat, there are a couple of points that you were interested in talking about today. And one of those was the accessible housing, livable housing that is coming in in... October, the 1st of October this year, and um, we had a bit of a chat and we've gone away and had a look at it. And would you like to just give a maybe a brief explanation of what, what those standards are that are being introduced? Yeah, sure. And I think, I guess what I'd like to start by saying mm. is that 
master builders and builders, we, we support livable housing. Mm. We support energy efficient housing. Yeah. Um, we support accessible housing. We yeah. really do. Um, what, what we also support as well is affordable housing mm. um, and reasonable solutions. And what we would like to see is support for builders in that transition mm. to what is quite a big change. And mm. that's really where we're coming from in some of our advocacy on this to say, it's not just a simple matter. When you change a national construction code, mm. um, even though there have been livable housing guidelines in the in the past, and, mm. and that's absolutely true, they've been there, there's silver, gold and platinum, and they are used um, by various providers. They're used in um, a lot of aged care and other um, social housing. There's a lot of housing out there that does... Yeah. It is built to gold standard or silver standard. Um, so those things exist. But when you translate that into the building code or the National Construction mm. Code, as it's now called, when you translate that into something that must be complied with in order to get your occupancy certificate, mm -hmm. the it's, it's different. And the rules have to be translated into, into a workable compliance solution. So I'll just, if I can pull up, here, um, I put together just a bit of a timeline just to explain yeah. where we came from and and what is sort of involved in this and why it's a bit tricky. So, yeah. so you can see there was a lot of consultation that occurred from 2000 and, well, 2018 really, it's, it started on this timeline. Um, I've used the word RIS regulatory impact um, statement. So there's Michael informed so, me on that <coughs> yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So um, regulatory impact analysis or yeah. assessment. So when a policy is proposed by government, um, governments go out and consult and talk to impacted um, stakeholders, mm. get their views, and then um, then there's a decision regulatory impact. So it pulls it all together and says this is the information we found to guide the decision making. It was quite long too. I was having a look at the RIS or the one that I pulled up from the Master Builders website or the NCC website and it was 348 pages. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get through the whole thing. <laughs> but I read I read the um I read the background and and the exec summary. Yeah, yep. it was cute, <laughs> lots of work yeah. yeah. Lots of um work in there and um I guess it wasn't really something that I had necessarily knew what that before I was talking to you that this was all coming about and then reading the background and why it's important and the cost for those I thought um, oh like gee whiz it, it is a huge space and and so important and I even saw when I was looking at your timeline on that back in 2009 was when yeah. they did that national dialogue for that to try and get it in in 2020. Yeah. And that, that was ages ago. Yeah, and, and I can understand that there are advocates mm. who are advocates for the accessible housing, for yeah. livable housing, who are saying, well, you know, you've, you've been telling us it's coming for so long. Yeah. Um, stop mucking around and just bring it in. And I can see that. So that point of view yeah. um, but when we look at this and we see um, if you actually look at where so 2021 consultation drafts start getting mm -hmm. released so now we're starting to get into some of the nuts and bolts and nitty-gritty about how is this actually going to work and if you're not in the building industry you might think well there's this guideline there's design guidance mm -hmm. out there why not just do that like yeah. just do it. it it just it just do that it just isn't that simple. Um, the elements have to all fit together and you have to get everything just right. You have to make sure there's products that will actually, sufficient products that will meet and comply and um, workable solutions. So there was lots of um, you know discussions really yeah. in the weeds around um, what's the maximum threshold, what's the maximum step, what's the maximum gradient for a ramp, what's the maximum yeah. length for a ramp, what's... so All those technical requirements. Yeah, and they, they all um, mix together, and I've, I've got another slide and I'll get to that, but I just wanted to point out on this slide how you can see that there's this long period, and as you mm. say, it actually goes back further mm. in history, but then right at the end, we've got all these really quite critical things that are all bunched up together. So mm -hmm. we've got... Um, decision was made and we're going to adopt it and Victoria and Queensland said 
uh, 1 October 2023. So Oh, so that's just Victoria and Queensland? At the moment, yes. Right. So other states, so the other states are adopting either later, like at least a year later or, or more. Yeah. Um, some state, some um, jurisdictions have said no, not adopting, okay. um, and some are waiting to see. Right. So, was this a decision made through the Building um, Ministers Forum or...? Meeting, yeah, meeting? which is now the BMM, the Building the Ministers BMM. Meeting. So it's a little bit complex, but essentially, yes, they made that decision. Some states have automatic additional time, but then they put more time on that again. Um, so as a group, they went, oh, yeah, and we'll adopt it from 1 October, but then automatically some states were out, some states were longer. Some, so it's Victorian Queensland, it's also the ACT. Um, so those are the jurisdictions that have... Adopt I always say ACT, it's a bit smaller and flatter and <laughs> <laughs> lucky them. Um, so, so yeah, so that decision was made and, and we didn't know when October 23 was going to be the date. Mm. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise. It was like, oh, we've been, we've been asking for longer um, because there's so much to do. So then you can see, so a, a version of the, of the code was released on 1 October. Yes. Um, and then there were elements of the livable housing that needed to be tweaked there was a there was a committee process and another version of it came out in December um, so it's fixing up a few bits and pieces essentially mm -hmm. um, so then we're waiting on the next step is some guidance from the ABCB um, which is yet to come and implementation so you can see we're starting to mm. you know we're seven months out and is the gut so the guidance from the ABCB is that the is that because have they have they already come out with the um, the ACB? Oh, it's all right. Yeah, so many acronyms. Sorry, the Australian ABC Building Codes Board. Yep, yep, yep. Have they already come out with those technical those, those technical requirements that sit alongside the, the so, NCC? Let me pull up this. So the NCC, yeah. So it's got performance requirements. And then it's got yeah. deemed to satisfy, so DTS deemed to satisfy yeah. provisions so that everyone can understand, okay, there's a performance requirement mm -hmm. to do a thing um, and this is a provision telling me that if I do this, then I satisfy that requirement. Yeah. And then there's reference documents and then there's certain exemptions that you can have. There's a Queensland Development Code where there can be variations. Mm. Um, and then um, you can talk to a, you can talk to designers and certifiers around performance mm. solutions, which are different solutions to the deemed to satisfy. So it's not it's not actually easy, and There's it all a has lot to of it all has to interrelate. And so one example of that relationship with other parts of the code is so step free entrance into a house, mm. and if that's through the front door. Um, so no, um, quite a lot of people find in their houses they've got to step up, mm -hmm. and the reason they've got to step up is about water water and grass. Mm. So uh, we want to make sure that water doesn't come into the house in, you know, downpours and storms. So we've got to make sure with step free entrances mm. that we also have water management. Um, and we're still sort of working through some of that as to, and, and this, mm. people will turn up and say, oh, you can just put in a strip down channel chain, channel drain or whatever. Yeah. You could do this, you could do that. And that's fine. But you actually have to get it all written down and accepted those, and agreed and in the DTS. Yeah. So yeah, so hmm. there's there's it, it's not easy. No. And it's not a simple matter of picking up a design guide that's been in place and going, just do that. Yeah. Because it, it actually has to be really quite clear rules because we're talking about a home getting an occupancy certificate or not. Mm. So does it comply, does it not comply? And mm. does it meet not just these provisions, but all the other provisions? Mm. I mean, there are a lot of documents. I can imagine it would be um, difficult to follow for contractors who are designing and building these homes to change that, to understand how all of the documents work together if they have to reference everything. Is there much help or guidance they can go to when these come in? So we're yet to see some really clear guidance mm. from either the ABCB or nationally or Queensland mm. government. Um, we're, we're asking for that. Certainly Master Builders, we've provided information, we've got fact sheets, we're doing webinars, um, we ran information about it in last year's roadshow mm. and all of those things are happening. But to be fair, the rules changed a little bit since that roadshow, so, so we need to talk about 
the changes, what's changed since then in this year's roadshow. Yeah. Um, so we're we're doing what we can, and I mean builders builders are professionals. Build, yeah. I mean builders are um, qualified. Mm. Builders know they're trained and they know how to read a code. They know yeah. how to comply with a code, and that's yeah. part of being a builder or or a um, qualified trade contractor. Mm. But you're right, they absolutely do need really clear guidance and information and training and all sorts of things to mm. to know. And I think, um, yeah, we I put together a bit of a slide saying, why did we want a transition? Mm-hmm. And, and this is part of the reason. So we need to understand the connections. We need to understand where we might need different solutions. We need... We need design changes. People need to reprice, reorganise supply chains, upskill all of their teams. Mm. And the big one on the end there is display homes. And I think this is one that keeps getting overlooked. So there's a period of time to organise a display village, to get designs up, to build display homes, and then they stay as a display village for a certain period of time before they're on salt, before they transition out and new display villages open up. Um, so a lot of display homes now that people will be going to look at looking to buy a house Mm. they are not compliant when it comes to october yeah they they do not have um so there's one being built at the moment um that will but i don't know that that will be ready um so so not all display homes that people go and visit in fact a lot of display homes that people go and Mm. visit say in october of this year will not what they what that person gets will not be the same mm. and that makes it difficult that Do makes they it difficult. get sold now how does that oh, i guess that's a i was saying what happens with those <laughs> well quite often so them. or just get renovated pers- to meet it yeah person wanting to look at how quite often people go into a display home and go I want this yeah. and in the they go as per display I just okay. want exactly what I saw or I want this but but that and that and they get a real idea of this is what I want yeah. and that's why, why we have them so people can get a feel for what is it going to look like yeah um, but it's going to be different it'll be well actually it won't be this you're you're now going to have um, the the toilet space needs to be substantially longer um, so we're not going to have um, a linen cupboard anymore or mm-hmm. we're going to reconfigure a bathroom on the ground floor. The design's now, um, the kitchen has been moved over here and there's a smaller um, living area um, in order to accommodate the wider hallways mm-hmm. um, and the and various other things. Or the bathroom will now have a, a cavity slider instead of, instead of a hinge door because um, we've got to get some clearances in. So mm-hmm. it's just a process and a training of those sales staff as well mm. around what do they need to inform customers about. Mm. Um, and again, we'd love government to provide some information for consumers as mm. well. We, we will have some. but It's mm. one of the issues as before this was that there's always been this issue for builders, particularly residential builders, that you know, to, to be able to produce something which meets the expectations of the homeowner who has been sold a product based on a display home. So what you're saying here is that that just ratchets up even more because yep. because clearly there are things that are going to, have to be told almost you know very directly to no it's going to have to be different it can't be yes. like this yes because you, you can't have that's, this yeah you know, that 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 disconnect between uh, expectations and reality is that's when disputes arise yeah, yeah. And, and that's really one of the big driving factors for us to say we we want a longer transition from when the rules are announced and known. So from when from when the rules are known to when they actually have to be complied with to get your occupancy certificate, we want that longer transition. Um, and from the other side, they're saying, well, it's how long do we have to wait? Um, but it, I think we need to do it properly. Um, and unfortunately, with such a short transition, I, I just feel that... Um, it's, it's incredibly complex and we've got this one-size-fits-all approach through the National Construction Code of just going, every house has to meet mm-hmm. these rules, um, yet we've got so many variances and issues, small lot developments. Um, mm. There's just, there's a lot, you know, raised houses create... So, slow, yeah, slow yeah. yeah. And I've got a picture up here of the uh, the traditional Queenslander and we did yeah. raise... There were, there were concerns and there has been a concession that um, the step-free access... Um, there will be exemptions for step-free yeah. access to raised houses, so that's okay. That's so good. that will apply across. Does it apply across the board? Or? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. What other exemptions are there? That's probably the main one um, mm. around the rules that if the house is a certain height or if, or if the length, um, I don't have them in front of me and yeah. they're, they're technical, but it's around, you know, what is the maximum length, the gradient, the, the slope um, or the mm. height of the house. So if you, yeah. you know, there's no requirement, essentially it was to say there's no requirement to have zigzagging ramps mm. across the front yard of someone's house taking up the entire front yard. That's yes. not... That's they not don't required. expect that, yeah. No, and that's that's a good um, that was a good clarification, and and those things were sort of clarified mm. in that December December version, which was great. Um, th- this slide is really about that issue of housing affordability versus some of the changes, and um, you know, house prices over the last three years have increased substantially, and we know that our um, we know that the um, labour and materials costs have increased the output cost of housing by forty two percent over three years in Queensland, so. Big, That's massive. Big, big. Mm. So when you take that into account, and then we add on NCC changes, and it's not it's not just livable housing. We've got waterproofing changes. Um, there's new you know requirements for falls to non mandatory floor waste, and this is all going to put your um, listeners to sleep. So we won't go into it. But there's a lot of changes that are cost that do cost money. Change costs mm. money, and when they're added together, we get to potentially over twenty thousand dollars added into a house. And when we're in a when we're in a a bit of a crisis at the moment like we are um we're going well is now the right time to bring it all in um like this and that's it's just another complication th- that we have i'll make a comment relevant to when they did the riz if there's still this all outstanding detail how could the riz have been ac- accurately reflected <laughs> the true cost of the changes and, and the extent of the changes if we're still going through confirming what the changes are. Yeah, that's and look, they, it was a really lengthy exercise and that, that's a fair comment. There were, I, I wasn't in muster builders at the time and um, I've got colleagues who were, obviously. Um, it, it, was a, it was a lengthy exercise and, and it's a national exercise yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but the cost, I mean, the cost benefit analysis was, um, it didn't, it, it doesn't add up in terms of dollars for for the livable housing provisions. Um, so the, the cost outweighs, mm. I mean, look, in, in simple terms, how that, what that means is cost outweighs benefit in terms of the analysis done. Now, mm. I don't want to get into a debate yeah. around um, the benefits of livable housing because I know that those benefits don't have a dollar figure um, for people who need accessible housing and people who want accessible housing. Mm-hmm. That's not a dollar figure. Um, but they do try and put a dollar figure on that. So that's how they do that cost benefit analysis. But what it does show is that there is a cost um, and the cost is not insignificant um, mm-hmm. in order to have that result happen. So given that, we feel that it's really important to get support for industry, to get information out, information for consumers, training, time for display homes to catch up. So given that outcome, that's why we're saying we feel industry needs a bit longer. And I was trying to think about what what might be a suitable analogy. And I had had trouble, but I thought, okay, imagine if the government decided that bakeries could no longer sell products with gluten. And it had been talked about and talked about, but no one was really sure exactly how it would work. And then they brought in the laws. um, And by the time they sort of worked out what the law would look like, you had 10 months. Bakeries had 10 months to make the transition to products with no gluten. Mm. So they would need, and no support, no assistance, no financial help, no subsidies, no information for consumers as yet. Hopefully it's coming. Um, But they've got to sort their new supply chains. They've got to deal with training their staff. They've got to work out how they're going to do the cost increases, what product, you know, how they're going to sell their products so consumers want it, because now they've got to have gluten-free bread. Some people won't be able to afford gluten-free bread. How do we deal with all of that? Can you imagine that happening in any mm. other industry but the building industry? I, I just, I can't. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's a, probably not quite the same, but just the taxation changes, the proposed mm. taxation changes to super. You know, that's been announced, but it won't be, you know, LAW or implemented until a couple of years down the track. Post, yep. post it. So at least everyone knows and, you know, let the debate rage. Um, between now and the next couple of years. Yeah. That's really the transition, really, isn't it? It's and the trouble with the building industry, if we can move, I'm probably moving into other areas now, but <clears throat> the problems that we have, for me, um, from mm. my perspective, from my viewpoint in Queensland, 
it's been a torrential downpour of legislative regulatory change um, as part of the Queensland building plan. And I know the minister gets out there and the department will get out there and say all the great things that they're doing. Um, and for some parts of the industry, they do support that. But for the builders, by and large, for the builders, these are all complex administrative burdens that are just tying them up in red tape and just suffocating them in the red mm. tape of all the changes. They're just, I mean, MFRs is, is a big one. Um, with, with no, you know, we've had a report done that's shown that it's not actually made a difference in insolvencies in Queensland. It hasn't produced a benefit. It's, it's a huge impost the way that it works. We've got no problem with financial requirements, not a problem. Um, they, they exist throughout the world, really. Um, it's not just Australia, it's not just Queensland. Um, other jurisdictions have a much simpler framework. Um, project trust accounts, mm. intensely complicated. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I was just thinking what would be the difference between the transition into project trust accounts and how that's come through over the past couple of years and the transition into the accessible housing. Like, so, <clears throat> um, excuse me, one, one important thing with project trust accounts is that they don't apply to single dwelling or duplex yeah. contracts. So yeah. that is important for everyone it's to remember. Three. Yeah, three, three or more three dwelling more. units, yeah. yeah, for residential work and then all mm. other work. But certainly it's going to capture a lot of, um, project trust accounts will capture a lot of the industry, mm -hmm. um, particularly once they roll out as intended. Mm -hmm. And in the um, latest Ministerial Construction Council communique, there was a, a commitment to that noted in the communique. So um, that's, a, that's going to be a really big impost. Um, mm -hmm. And we know from we know from discussions with members that they've been approached that Deloitte was engaged by the government and uh, and approached um, some of our members, uh, as well as no doubt some of the industry client our members, um, to talk about what are the um, what do they see as the barriers to getting some kind of software solution to yeah. assist to assist businesses because there's no current compliant mm -hmm. software solution to assist businesses to comply with the intensely complicated rules that exist, all the notice provisions, all the requirements, there's fiduciary obligations, which you actually can never get rid of with the software solution, but that's a story for another day. Um, or the, the finance, you know, all of the requirements, they're just, it really is intensely com complicated. And the reason for that is because project trust accounts is a legislated, legislated framework, the way it is in Queensland, is um, it does not lend itself to this, so mm. a contractor's working account on a project that they have money in and out and paying lots of different subbies and suppliers and themselves and employees and all sorts of things that come, it's a working account. For a working account like that to be a trust account with all of these intense rules and restrictions and forms and processes is not workable in our view. Mm. It is very complicated, isn't it? I, Michael and I, we've, Helix have, um, written online training for the project trust accounts and and c compliance have been working on something to help peop dif different people in the industry understand the trust accounts and and giving advice to people on whether their pro whether their contracts will apply like the PTAs will apply to their different projects and whatnot and it and we've tried to break it down into different infographics to understand <laughs> yeah. the different part. Put you it know, in pictures. If you know yeah. Michael, you yeah. know that he loves a yeah. good infographic. Yeah. Very good and, at it. Um, it's, it's, it is so complicated every time going back to that and, and understanding it and then kind of understanding the, the gaps that might exist in it too. And we've had a look and like trying to inter interpret the legislation to see how that works. Um, it's, it's it's it is complicated. It's fascinating. You know, you could try to tempt, you know, and Emily's very, Emily's very good at this in terms of she's the one that does the graphs, but you can template and, and, and try to predict or get a feeling for how the legislation would work in practice. But sometimes you've actually just got to be working with a real life case. And we've worked with a couple now where, where and there's one particular, I mean, I was going to go into the details, but. It's, it's what I call the intersection between contractual norm over the past, it's got to do with innovating contracts, and yep. the administration of the retention, you know, existing retention trust accounts. 
until you get into the weeds and actually go through and see what the legislation requires and contractually what, what you're trying to achieve, it's, you, you couldn't predict that. You've just got to work through that type of... And I notice there's a whole lot yeah. of now commentary. I've been waiting for it from insolvency practitioners about... Um, they, they just won't... Yeah, some are saying we just won't appoint... We won't accept building appointments. Yep, because, I've heard that too. Because of yep. that. Yeah, so it's, it's not as if they, they're saying, well, we understand how the law works. We're not going to try to bust down the, the, you know, the, how the law works. But we just... So these unintended consequences... Mm are going to happen all the time and it's going to be a little bit of a piece by piece analysis about how it all stacks up at the end, I think. There were really good e examples brought up in the report that we were looking at when we, were, we wanted to see with this novation issue, oh, has anybody raised it? Is anything around? And there were really, like, there were various other very sp specific um, issues raised and I was saying to Michael, how, wh why isn't there anything to do with novation? This seems to be normal, but Michael explained, like, you, it's just got to get tested mm -hmm. and then find yeah. the gaps and then yeah. it will get fixed. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a bit like that. Um, and so retention trust accounts are a bit simpler, I guess, in my view, to, to project, project trust accounts. And they retention lends itself to a trust concept mm -hmm. more than a project trust account. So really see them as two quite different policy um, you know, outcomes, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. project trust accounts, there's a lot of talk that you hear around, you know, we've, we've locked away money for subcontractors and that's a great thing. And it's like, well, yeah, payment to subcontractors is undisputably something that, that is important. Mm -hmm. But there's not evidence of widespread non-payment of subcontractors um, and certainly not outside insolvency. Um, so where there are problems, I'm not saying there's no problems, mm. of course there are problems, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's, there's, um, there's a process in place. There's a regulator with plenty of tools in the toolkit to manage those instances as they arise um, without a project trust account being needed. A project trust account might be considered to be a solution in an insolvency. We haven't seen it yet. Um, and I don't know that it will actually produce the outcome everyone thinks because if the money's not in the account and, and when, a, when a contractor becomes insolvent, usually, well, I'm not an insolvency expert, but, but we understand that typically there's not cash sitting in accounts when, and when a company becomes insolvent. So even in a trust account concept, um, we're not really sure that there's going to be money just there because quite often if there's an issue that has led that contractor to go to the wall, um, the client may not have made their payment. Mm. So if that money's not there and the contractor hasn't been able to use their own funds to put into the trust account as the top up, mm. because they do have to do that if the client doesn't pay, um, then the money's just not going to be there. Uh, so. I'm quite sceptical, personally, about how effective they will actually be um, in insolvency. And, and I say that, be, it, you know, knowing that I've been on the other side as an assistant commissioner going, well, they should be useful in an insolvency, you know, sitting there going there. But now, having sat there on, from the builder's side, looking through it and actually really looking at it going, ah, actually, actually I, don't, I don't think it will be. Mm. Um, and it really comes back to that complexity and the, the round peg in the square hole sort of thing that we've got around a trust account for a project. Um, and that's not to say that project trust accounts don't exist in the world. They do, they exist, Murray recommended them. What Murray recommended is not what Queensland legislated. What to did be very Murray clear. recommend? So cascading trusts, it's a simpler, simpler mm -hmm. process. They're, they're deemed cascading trusts. The legislative provisions, I've sort of had a bit of a look around um, what's in place in Canada and the UK, the legislative provisions are, are pretty minimal. Um, so it's really just saying that account for the contractor, the money money that's in there is on trust, like it's deemed to be on trust. Mm -hmm. So the obligations for the contractor aren't great, like it's just to be aware that that money exists in trust. If there's an event, the insolvency practitioner can go in and basically that money the 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 subbies have a better chance of getting paid yes. because of the deemed trust so it's arrangement. it's not actually in a trust account. It's just deemed to be it's on a, trust. It's yeah, it's com complex, yeah. but it's 
it's deemed statutorily deemed to be a trust and it's cascading through all all layers um right. and in the feedback in the consultation that murray did and in his report he makes the note that the subcontractor groups actually said yes we want trust but not cascading we don't want we don't want subcontractors to have to have money on trust for their sub subcontractors mm. and he sort of made the point that well hang on a minute um how can that be so mm. So, you know, if it exists, and, and why not, why is there no, you know, from our point of view as, as builders, why is there not an obligation on the developer to have the money and trust? So why is everything always on the builder? And I guess that's kind of where we come from to say, we've got all these laws that are coming in the building plan, and it seems like all of the obligations, all of the burdens, all mm. of the cost in post, all of the time in post, it all it seems to be sitting on the builder mm. when you look at it. And a good example of that, unfair contracting. I was just about oh. to say that <laughs> and I had a conversation about that a little while ago about those and um does my head in yeah so for anyone who doesn't know unfair contracting um law in Queensland there's a head of power to say there can be prohibited or mandatory contract terms mm. um there was there's a ministerial construction council subcommittee set up to explore that um and um Without going into any of the detail, I can say Master Builder's position was, um, how can we have, it was called fairness in contracting, the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. How can we have fairness in contracting when the head of power to set that up, the only person who can be found to have actually been, um, to have committed an offence mm -hmm. is the builder. So if the head contract between a developer and a builder has unfair terms, now, yes, those terms can be deemed to be prohibited, um, but the only person who can have an offence, who can commit an offence for that, is the builder. Mm -hmm. So the builder commits an offence for entering into a contract with a developer that contains an unfair term. How, how is that? The other thing too that sort of, you know, you, when, you, when you start having this conversation at a particular point of time about what is a good term and what is a bad <laughs> yeah. term, um, <coughs> prior to COVID, a lot of people would have thought a bad term would be cost escalation. I would say now a good term yeah. <laughs> is, is cost escalation because that's a survival so mechanism. So it's ever changing. So it's, you, you know, you, you, you just got to be careful yeah. when you, when you put in a piece of legislation at a particular point of time, you don't know how, okay, once in a hundred year pandemic is a hard, hard thing to, to predict. I understand that, but you just don't know. Yes, and I think the more that we get, the more that they get into the prescriptive nature of trying to say what's in and what's out, um, the more you sort of get tripped up. And this is the project trust account trap, I guess. The more there's sort of all these convoluted detailed provisions and then people go, oh, hang on, but what about this? And I've been caught here and I've been caught there. And then suddenly the rules are so complex that no one knows how to actually comply with them. Um, and we've also got federal laws that have expanded significantly recently and will apply to a number of participants in the building industry. So Master Builders also sort of said, look, we, we just don't think there's been enough consideration because because they're new, but not enough consideration of how that's going to impact. And we, we just think now's not not, a, not the right time. Like we just shouldn't really be doing this until we fix up other things. And when you look at that particularly, that, that reg house that's been sitting in Biffa since 2017 to mandate or prohibit clauses and it's still vacant yep. in 2023 it, it's it's that uncertainty which is very you know i've written about this it's an uncertainty have the conversation make the decision but, but if you don't make a decision but there's a reg power there for it to be people are just going to think well what's going to when when it's going to happen and what it's going to look like yeah and that's more you know six years that reg power's been if i'm correct it's yeah been sitting there yeah without any details on what is prohibited and what's mandated. And I think, you know, let's assume that it was put in with all the with right intent. Intentions. Yeah, and I think, I think I'm think i sure it was put in with, yeah. with good intention. Um, but then for the head of power to actually only have the builder, like if the if it's the building contractor who's in the gun, and I think, how can that be? Yeah, no, I should make the point. I'm, I'm certain that there was always good intent behind the policy. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah you can, you were trying to frame trust, so you were trying to make sure that the, mm. that everything was corralled, that you know people couldn't try to manipulate yeah. the intention of the trust protection yep. through through contractual swifties. I, I get all that, and it's so it was, the intent was very good. It's just that it's just sat there 
in this almost too hard basket that I've got the problem with. And the other, this is a bit, bit at a higher level now, just to come up a step, but um, we seem to have this um, thinking in Queensland that we'll, we'll pass all these laws and we'll just keep passing laws to, to make everything fair and we, we'll pass the law, we'll issue the media release and everything will be better um, somehow. Um, not really sure, but instead of actually looking at, well, construction is, is a system. So we've got to start thinking about this as a system instead of this linear relationship of subcontractor, contractor, principal, and this happens, that happens, that happens. It's not, nothing is simple like that. We've, we've got to go, okay, there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of factors that all interplay. And if you, if you poke something over here, it's gonna come out over here. Um, and we've got to start looking at that whole thing as a system to say, if we want to improve practices in the in the system, what are the levers that we can really use and manipulate to try and do that in a way that doesn't cause a massive explosion or a blowout over here? Um, so things like, are we promoting collaborative contracting? Are we promoting um, good working relationships on site? Are we promoting improving the culture of the industry so that we're not in this race to the bottom of competitive lump sum tenders and just everyone does the it's the lowest common denominator on projects to get it as cheap and as quick as possible get in get out um now no the answer is we're not um i mean the industry associations are but where is the focus on all of that mm -hmm. to try and say well let's see what we can do to actually influence good outcomes because when you've got like what is the root cause of these issues of insolvencies, of non-payment, of defective work. How do we actually stop that before it happens? And we've got to start focusing on that. And that's a big part of that is builders need to be paid properly for their work. We've got to stop this situation of, you know, gross margins of 5% and the like and things that we hear about. That's abs like, there's no way that that's acceptable to me. Um, and there's no way that a builder should ever have to build a project for someone else, build an asset that someone else is going to own and not make money on the job. Mm -hmm. Who else, do you, would you get an architect to design drawings for you for free? Mm -hmm. There's no way. Um, but why do we say, oh, well, that was your tender price, too bad, so sad. Um, mm -hmm. And so the project trust account issue is a, is a big one because we hear about builders entering into contracts or um, putting in tenders, having the tender accepted, so <clears throat> contract formed, um, and they didn't realise that it was project trust work or project a project trust account project and they needed to do that. So now everyone's scrambling because we've got to set it all up, we've got to do everything, we've got to guess, we've got systems, how are we going to comply? I'm going to have to put on more people, I'm going to have to you know, spend money to comply, but the client's not going to pay for that because you put in your tender, that's on you. There's no requirement to have in the tender documents whether or not the project is a project trust account project. Truly? Oh, amazing. It's, it's a, yeah, we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but the depth, they came up with a new definition of you know, project trust work, which 50% mm -hmm. of a contract has to be project trust work. It was originally building work, wasn't it? The, so that, yeah, that, that's that's a difficult analysis to to yep. contractually understand the very beginning because mm. obviously variations can push you over afterwards too. So that's when yep. that comes into play. Yep. A poorly scoped out contract at the beginning might be forty percent well under, but if it was poorly scoped out in terms of the overall scope, and there was another huge chunk of work which involves fifteen percent project trust work, it's it becomes a captured contract. Yeah. And then you've got to negotiate for that variation to try and make sure, are you pricing it in? And not just the price of just what's right in front of you, but think about if you're setting up the project trust, you're going to have audit requirements. You're going to have all these other things that are going to happen um, that you've got to price in because otherwise you're paying for it from the shirt off your back. I mean, these are the sorts of, this is the reality that the industry is facing. And these are the things that then will lead to businesses either voluntarily closing because it is just all too hard um, or involuntarily closing in unfortunate circumstances. And I said, well, how can it be that a policy that's meant to secure payment can actually end up sending contractors to the wall? Like, that mm -hmm. can't be good policy if that's 
if that's a potential outcome. So that's one of the reasons why we're saying do not roll this out. Um, do not roll it out any further. Yeah, I've, I've never seen a government do anything other than want to do the right thing in this space, irrespective of the colours of the government. You know, so, so, yeah. so I'm sure that's the case here. There's, there's been a whole lot of good intention behind it all. But the, you know, the more that the rubber hits the road, and, you know, and em Emily and I see it on a daily basis when we're dealing with these minute issues in terms of is it, is it a project trust work? But then the other thing too is that, as Emma and I were speaking yesterday about, the, you know, a, a, an MFR issue with the QBCC can roll into a, a project trust issue which is which is contractors got to understand that that you know mm, you just yeah. got to you just got to make sure that you're keeping everything humming in, on all sides of the operations and vice versa a project mm. trust uh, issue can cause the QBC in I'm shooting legitimately to ask some questions about are you complying with the MFR yeah it's just a big ask to have this helicopter view of the world <laughs> and making sure that everything is humming from a contractor's point of view when they're also hit with all these, you know, the labour issues and the escalating costs, the labour shortages, yeah. it's... And it's that's a, huge issues, skills shortages, um, and that's, that's big because that's cost. So think about building a house, they say the time to build a house has doubled because largely the lack of skilled labour, like there just aren't enough trades out there to do all of the work that there is. So what do we go, what do? We do? Um, rather than, you know, pile red tape on the builder, let's look at what we can do to actually try and resolve some of these issues or, or make, you know, make things easier, looking at it as, as a system. Mm. Um, and the other, the other thing with the livable housing is that if you think about that as a system, we've said, said to government, you know, has there been work done with suppliers so that builders can call up a door supplier and know that this door is NCC 2022 compliant? Yeah. So I know that I've got compliant doors in my house because the supplier has verified that because the thickness of the door will depend whether you get a clear opening and again complicated technical mm -hmm. but it's easy to fall foul of the laws because they're so strict um, and we don't have that assistance through the system to know that it's all the bits are working together mm -hmm. so it so the onus isn't just on the builder to yeah. make sure that when they go to that they're asking for those specs and they they, they have collaboration between each of the parties well, it's yeah, and everyone's sort of working towards the same goal too. Mm -hmm. Like, how can how can we make your lives easier? And I'm sure it will sort of happen. But again, that's why we're saying, mm. hey, let's get the transition period right so that all of this stuff is in place, so that when when it really rubber hits the road and it's a matter of you either get occupancy or you don't, um, that we've got these things kind of lined up mm -hmm. and everyone knows what they're doing um, and we're ready to go. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, there. That's a lot of information for everyone to absorb. Great, good, in, great information, but a lot of information. And um, is there, and a lot of action happening as well. Is there any, I know that the Master Builders website has lots of great articles and policy updates and everything. Is there, is there any particular place you want to direct <laughs> what, people to? What, like this? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, um, we have an advocacy agenda. Um, for the coming year, mm -hmm. which I'm really excited about. Um, we focus on the elements of sustainable bus businesses, better mm -hmm. building practices, and fair and reasonable regulation. Um, so we think those are the, the core areas, and we'll be, we'll be fighting hard for our members to make sure that those things are in place as to mm -hmm. the best that we can on their behalf. Um, we also want to look positively to the future and say, mm -hmm. okay, you know, we're a great industry. There are so many talented, passionate people in this industry. How do we get out there and, and you know, shout it out? So we're looking to have some regional industry champions with Master Builders. I'm really looking forward oh, awesome. to that. What, yeah. what is a regional industry champion? Well, they'll essentially be voluntary um, positions, but mm -hmm. members who are really keen to get out there and promote the, um, the industry as a career of choice with mm -hmm. our regional managers and managers in our regional committees of management. Mm. Um, so it's really exciting to just yeah. just start that process and hopefully build on it as we yeah. go through the years and um, and just look to what we can do to say, hey, we want more people in the sector, um, not less, 
and we want it to be a great place to work. So how can we help our members to to achieve that? Mm, Sounds like great work. (laughs) Well, thank you for joining us today, Kate. I certainly learned a lot and got a lot out of the conversation and I hope that this episode and um, moving forward with our series, we can start to create a really good conversation around everything that's happening and break down those platitudes and cliches <laughs> and congratulations to helix on doing this i think it's just as i was saying earlier i think it's just fabulous to have this podcast series so well done to you guys and thank you for having me oh, thank thanks you. thanks kate and great job Em. oh great job yes. Michael. Great job. <laughs> thank you thank you I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. The information we discussed today was just that, information only. It is not specific advice. If you take action following something you heard today, it is important to make sure you get professional advice about your unique situation before you proceed, whether whether that advice be legal, financial, accounting, medical, or other advice. Please reach out to the Helix team if you have any questions or if there's another topic you'd like to explore. And if you know someone who might benefit from the show, remember to tell them about it or point them to our Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn.